fascinating. <laughs> oh, hello there. Welcome to Business Blaze. Someone asked me whether this was a green screen. It is not. Look, I can inter either either I'm a master of EGI or this is not a green screen. Look, I even have a skull down here. What's that movie? Uh, movie. What's that Shakespeare play? To be or not to be. It's not a real skull. Just just clarifying that. Business Blaze, we're back. I'm labbed up so I can move around, which apparently you guys love. Five of the world's biggest fraudsters. This is probably a tie-in with a biographics video, so if you've come over for biographics and this is the first video you're watching on this channel, you're probably wondering what the f is going on. My name is Simon, you probably know that. These scripts are written by Danny. I read them out, I make some comments, which might be amusing or just stupid, make your own judgment, smash that dislike button, let's carry on. Five of the world's biggest fraudsters. I'm pretty sure most of us have fallen for a scam at some memorably annoying point in your lives. Hopefully not too big though. I'll start off with a story. I, this was a few years ago, there's an app on the app store called Hotel Tonight. And I was like, I need a hotel tonight. I was like on a road trip and it was like, I was, we, we were like, we didn't make the destination we were supposed to stay in. So I was like, okay, let's book a hotel. This hotel tonight, I'd seen an advert for it. They were like, get unbelievable rates at a hotel through our app because we fill like the last minute that bookings that day. So I go into the hotel tonight app and I'm like, okay, I'm like in Strasbourg or whatever. And I go in and like type in like Strasbourg. And then I'm like, okay, great, book a hotel. And it's like, thanks for booking this hotel. We'll see you there, you know, on the 8th. And I'm like, but it's the seventh. And so I contact support and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The default is tomorrow. Cause we don't think people are going to be, you know, obviously they don't want a hotel tonight. And like, you are aware of the name of your app, right? And I was like, that's fine. I'll just take a refund. And they're like, no refunds. You hotel tonight. I've been racking my brains to come up with a memory of when I was a victim of fraud, but I couldn't really think of anything major. Lucky you, Danny. Although that's not really major. My hotel tonight one, it was like 60 pounds. Uh, I, I was upset, but I wasn't really angry. I'd like to think that this is because I'm far too sharp and quick-witted to be taken in by a trickster, but it's probably more likely that I just very rarely hand over money to anybody. <laughs> oh, the best example I can think of dates back to the 1990s when I responded to an ad in the local paper which offered lucrative business opportunities for people who fancied the idea of working from home. I, I realize these days that a cacophony of alarm bells would be going off at the sight of an ad which promises you that you can earn thousands of pounds a day by just sitting at home in your pants. I, these still exist though. I mean, how is it that you can still go onto a website and there'll be like a picture of someone holding a check from Google and being like, Sally makes $400 a day in her underwear working for Google. Or like, or, you know, doing some online business. <laughs> or like Google Pay site. Who the f clicks on this sh it's obviously fake. Although it would be kind of fun like to do a YouTube channel which just explores those scams. <laughs> you just go and you get suckered in by all of them to see what happens. B -b 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 Back in the 1990s, it seemed quite plausible to me. I'd heard a lot of people were making money at home by stuffing envelopes for marketing companies. And I guess this might be a similar thing. At the time, I was working from home anyway, running my own local dating agency based off my Commodore 64. True story, I was successful for a few years before the internet came along and destroyed it. Danny, your background is so fascinating. And people in the comments are often like, who the fuck is Danny? He's done everything. Last time it was like writing for architectural magazines. Then he had a dating agency. I just make YouTube videos. I gotta do more with my life. So I thought this might be an opportunity to earn a bit of extra money on the side when I wasn't busy matching up 22 year old fat blokes with 67 year old female bodybuilders. Might be why your business is. Yeah, the internet came along and destroyed my business, says Danny. <laughs> the matching system didn't always work quite as well as I'd hoped. I blame the Commodore 64. The only drawback was that I had to send off a 10 pound note along with a stamped addressed envelope to find out more details on this work from home opportunity. About a week later, my stamped addressed envelope was returned to me containing a tiny scrap of paper which read <laughs> to make your own money working from home simply put an advertisement like mine in your local paper makes you wonder why they really bothered replying at all i'm not sure that if it's some it, that it somehow made it any more legal is that even illegal i mean they are they, they, they do deliver on the promise <laughs> how is it that newspapers aren't just this now why is the advertising section anything but this i guess because people now know that it's a scam to be honest i was a bit gutted but it could have been worse. At least it was only 10 quid. Some of the more famous fraudsters in history had much bigger ambitions. Oh my God, let's actually get into the content, shall we? 
Barry Minko. Here's a heartwarming story about an American teenage entrepreneur who turned to one to, who turned to the dark side, but later found forgiveness and redemption by becoming a born again Christian and an expert fraud investigator. And that's an important thing. Like, if you're gonna commit crimes, always commit crimes that are like useful to the police later on. Like, catch me if you can, that Frank Abernale dude. They got him out of prison because he was so useful in investigating like check fraud or something to the FBI. It's like awesome. Or that TV show White Collar, which obviously is fictional, but the same thing. The guy who's in prison, um, what's his name? I don't remember it now. That's such a great show. Neil Caffrey. Uh, he's in prison, but he's such a good con man that the FBI like hire him as a consultant. He has this amazing life just hanging out. Um, rather than being in prison. Uh, although that ended up going a bit pear-shaped too. Born in Inglewood, California, Barry Minko, this is a beast by the way, we're gonna be here a while. Uh, Barry, born in Inglewood, California, Barry Minko was just 15 years old when he launched his own carpet cleaning business from his parents' garage in 1982. Good for him. Bearing in mind most of us would still have been chewing over whether it was time to quit our paper rounds, you have to admire the ambition and the zeal of young Barry. I kinda do, I like that. The American dream! If we're being hypercritical, it's probably worth pointing out that Barry's business was a bit rubbish. It went under the name ZZZZ Best. That is a terrible name. Or, if you're American, ZZZZ Best. Uh, pronounced Z Best, apparently. That's a very 15 year old name for a company, isn't it? Quite a distinctive name, but unlikely to appear anywhere near the top of business directories at the time. Which is, by the way, why Acme Corporation is such a common name, because AC would go near the front of the yellow pages. Uh, Barry was obviously too young to drive, so he had to rely on scrounging lifts from friends and family to make his carpet cleaning appointments. And in the early days of business, he was bombarded with complaints from unhappy clients and late payment demands from suppliers. However, by 1986, Barry had miraculously managed to turn the business around, and he became the youngest leader in history to float a business on the Nasdaq? Holy sh That's a step- I thought it was gonna be like, yeah, now he's got, like, employees. Nope, he's a publicly traded company. <laughs> he was 19! What am I doing with my life? This is my big problem with business plays. It's always like, oh, these people are so successful. Although these people are all con artists, so I'll feel better about myself not being a con artist. For now. <laughs> Join my pyramid scheme, link below. Or buy my merch. By the following year, Zbest uh, reached a market capitalization of $280 million, while Yang Barry's own personal fortune was estimated to be $100 million. Good lord. Banks and investors seemed happy to pour millions into the company, based largely on the impressive portfolio of clients that Barry had managed to build up. Well, it was mostly down to one particular client, really, an insurance restoration company called Interstate Appraisal, Ser Appraisal Services, which accounted for 90% of Zbest's revenues. Even that is suspicious, because that is a ton of carpet cleaning <laughs> for a company. Like, how big does that company, if it's got, if the company's got a market cap of $280 million, let's assume its revenue for something like that is $100 million a year. So really, is a company spending $90 million a year on carpet cleaning? That seems a little bit. The problem with interstate appraisal services this entirely fabricated by Barry Minko. I knew there was something up. Apparently no one else did. <laughs> In fact, Barry's business dealings have been dubious from the very beginning. He had managed to conquer those early teething problems of business by stealing his grandmother's jewelry, staging burglaries at his office, and engaging in credit card fraud. Oh my. It was the latter that came back to bite him. Yeah, like, grandma's not gonna send you to jail. <laughs> Grandma ain't calling the cops. Barry had raked in $72,000 from credit card fraud, and it was blamed all on unscrupulous contractors and dodgy employees, and he had agreed to pay back most of his victims, except for one, a female homemaker who Barry had overcharged by a few hundred dollars and then decided she wasn't worth paying back. If this comes back, this, so this comes back to bite him, it reminds me of that there's a fantastic movie with Joan Hill called War Dogs, which I don't feel gets the credit that it should for being hilariously awesome. And it's like the whole thing falls apart because of one, one thing they forget to do. They forget to pay these people who repack all this ammunition for them. And it was such an insanely low amount of money. And they just were like, fuck it, we won't pay it. And it completely screws them. Credibly, he might have gotten away with the scams for far longer if he had paid that lady. The homemaker ended up going to the Los Angeles Times with her story, which led to exposure of Barry's previously shifty act, previous shifty activity. And intense media scrutiny on his current dealings. Uh, I feel a few videos ago, I made fun of people for going to the press with their stories that no one cares about. There must be more to this, right? I make, like, you go into the Los Angeles Times and you're like, yeah, so I got my carpet cleaned and uh, the guy stiffed me like a hundred bucks. And the Los Angeles Times reporter's like, what? And then you like inserted heroin into your butt and sent you to like, Canada? Like, there's gotta be more, right? Like, you're part of like a people smuggling ring? With carpet cleaning? Something? No? <laughs> Los Angeles Times. Apparently they care. 
It eventually became clear that Barry was effectively running nothing more than a Ponzi scheme. Simon recently posted a business plans video on Ponzi schemes, which you will forget to link to. I'll link to that below, along with all the other shit I'm mentioning. But it's one about how pyramid schemes caused a civil war in Albania, although they weren't really pyramid schemes and it wasn't really a civil war. Yeah, that was a video where I was like, Danny, I heard about this. And then Danny was like, that's not what happened. And I was like, write the goddamn script, Danny! Barry was essentially just setting up fake companies, writing phony invoices, and shuttling investments between different bank accounts and businesses to give the illusion of a profitable enterprise which wasn't actually doing that much of value. I understand how that works. How the f do you get listed on the NASDAQ? <laughs> no one looks at the books? Are we that incompetent? What am I doing with my life? In 1989, he faced 57 counts of racketeering, bank fraud, embezzlement, and money laundering, and was sentenced to 25 years in prison at the age of just 22. That's depressing. Oh, good news, you'll be out when you're 47. <laughs> However, he only ended up serving seven of them on grounds of good behavior, and during periods of incarceration, he made a few great buddies, most notably Jesus. And I'm guessing this is our Lord and Savior, rather than a Mexican dude called Jesus. You never know. I wish Jesus was a more common name in, like, English-speaking countries, it would be funny. Also, a friend of mine, <laughs> he's Spanish, and his mum's name is Conception. His dad's name is Angel. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah. After his release, he turned to evangelical Christianity and became the pastor of the Community Bible Church in San Diego. My pet, my, my grandparents became pretty evangelical Christians. Pretty annoying. <laughs> he also became a leading expert. Oh, you know what else is annoying? The people who are like, Simon. In the comments, they're like, Simon, I'd really like it if you bleeped out Jesus Christ. And I'm like, that's not a swear word. <laughs> Chill the f out. Smash that dislike button. He also became a leading expert in the fight against fraud, appearing regularly on television and publishing exposés on massive company scams. Over the years, it's claimed he uncovered over a billion dollars of fraudulent activity. That's impressive. But he ain't no Markopolis, is he? Uh, there was even a film planned about his life story. The film Minko would star Mark Hamill and recount Barry Barry's triumphant return, triumphant journey from dodgy teenage swindler to born again fraudster working on God's payroll. I have to say, some of these guys like who went to prison for interesting things, like there was uh, there's a great channel called like by a jewel thief. I can't remember what it's called but uh, it's pretty crazy. And he tells like all of these stories about being a jewel thief and he does like these reviews of jewel heists and stuff. And that is pretty amazing. And I'm like, yeah, like when you leave prison, you don't have many opportunities. Again, if you went to prison for something that the FBI wants or is like entertaining in some way, you're gonna be far better on the way out. Like if you go to prison for like murder, no one's gonna like the channel like, you know, reviewing murders or like talking about murder, but jewel thief, like international criminal, cat burglar, check forder, Forger. These are things that, you know, that's it's gonna be good. I mean, you still have to go to prison, which probably sucks, but like. Well, another thing to do, commit loads of crimes, get away with them, wait till the statute of limitations has run out, and then start a YouTube channel about it. Everyone loves a happy ending, except there was another chapter. It turns out that Barry was making a stack of money by shorting on the companies he was about to expose. So in other words, he would bet heavily against the fortunes of a company just before he was on the brink of publishing a report that was guaranteed to send the stock price plummeting. Is that illegal? Because if so, that's incredible. Where Business Blaze has, you know, PewDiePie level subscribers, I'll just be like, yeah, fake company name. Turns out to be a massive fraud. And it just happens that I've shorted the company extremely heavily the day before. I'd say that's actually really genius. He also set up the Fraud Discovery Institute, which eventually turned out to be a massive fraud in itself and stole millions of dollars from church donations up finances increasingly complex scams. Oh my. <laughs> In total, he spent another seven years in prison. Incidentally, that uplifting farm with, film with Mark Hamill still went ahead, but was retitled Con Man. Oh, that sounds quite good. I'd watch that. And that's tweaked the ending of the film quite a bit. He's like, yeah, Mark, you're going to have to come in for some reshoots. He went back to prison. Fucking hell, guys. I'm filming... He's in Star Wars, right? Gregor McGregor. I've seen, I've seen two Star Wars. One when I was a kid, when they were racing through the forest on like these bikes that flew. And then I saw the new one with the robot in the sphere. Both sucked. <laughs> Smash that dislike button. Gregor Mc... I might have to take a break because i got to go to the dentist. <laughs> Gregor McGregor. Many of the world's greatest scams involve creating fictional identities or fictional companies that drum up fictional profits. But it takes some nerve to create an entirely fictional country. By the way, Biographics people, you've probably seen my video on Gregor McGregor. If you're a business place person, you haven't heard of Biographics, which would surprise me because that channel's got like a million subscribers and this one has four. Um, go check out Biographics. Or just stay here watching this video, actually, because this channel, this channel needs the help. Tell a friend. Gregor McGregor was born into the Highland Scottish clan, the Clan Gregor, 
I feel it's always better when it's like not the Gregor clan, but the, the clan Gregor. It sounds way more Scottish. In 1786, the clan Gregor, most celebrated member, and in fact, Gregor McGregor's great great uncle, uh, was the Scottish outlaw folk hero Rob Rob Roy. Never heard of him. Uh, by the way, like. I feel like there's some accents that you're just like, Gregor McGregor, you just like make a bit, you know, aggressive, like Scottish or German, like the German accent, and it always sounds, you know, I feel that's how it is. Gregor McGregor is terrible. That's why I'm not an actor. Gregor McGregor's early career in the military showed great promise and even triumph. He served as an officer in the British Army for seven years and fought in the Peninsula War, before offering his services to Venezuela in 1812 and rising to the rank of general during the Venezuelan War of Independence. He was considered to be something of a hero in Venezuela, despite reports from squandering vital mission funds on luxury goods and abandoning his own British volunteer troops to a grisly fate so that he, could, he and his officer buddies could run away twice. <laughs> Dick move. It's like, yeah, uh... The officers, we're just gonna hang back. Uh, go over there, fight those guys, you'll be fine. <laughs> you'll get slaughtered and they run away. The officers run away. He's not gonna get you the Medal of Honor, is it, Gregor? Uh, Gregor McGregor returned to Britain in the 1820s with some exciting news. During his thrilling adventures around the world, the natives of the imaginary land, Pais, had gone and crowned him prince. Bloody hell. Poyas was supposedly a small country located near the Black River in what would now be considered a still undeveloped piece of land in modern day Honduras. McGregor was making out that he'd pretty much become the leader of Eden. He reckons that the land was fertile, the water was pure, the trees were overflowing with fruit, and the people were bur and the forests were bursting with game. He even reckons that there were trunks of gold in the riverbeds. Wow, people believe this shit? I guess there wasn't like Google Map or like other people, you'd be like, dude, I never heard of that place. You'd be like, no, it's there. We can't really Google it, can we boys? The really, the really good news was that he was happy to flog Poesian land certificates to any interested parties who wanted to secure their spot in the new world. He didn't shirk our marketing campaign either. You need to give him at least some credit for making his shit sound so authentic. An official 355 page guidebook was published, fictional parliaments and banking mechanisms were created, and Poyet-style ballads were composed and sung proudly on the streets of Glasgow. The campaign was largely targeted at his fellow Scots, and Gregor McGregor ultimately sold about 500 plots of land on Poyet, raking in about $200,000 in the process. That's well over $22 million in today's money, oh my god. About 270 emigrants sailed to the imaginary country that was destined to become their new home, only to find an underdeveloped druggle jungle with not so much as a hot dog stand. Ba -bum -bum. I didn't do that in the last video I recorded, so I did that one extra strong for you guys. The majority of them were unable to make their way back to the UK uh, and quickly died from yellow fever and malaria on McGregor's fictional land. Oh, that sucks. It's like the fire festival, but you know, with more death. <laughs> Shouldn't laugh, that's really terrible. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about this whole story is that Gregor McGregor is the only person in this list to have completely gotten away with it. When the game was up, he initially fled to the provinces of France, where he eventually was put on trial for conspiracy to defraud, but was amazingly acquitted on all charges after managing to dump off the blame on a co defendant who was hiding in the Netherlands at the time and unable to defend himself. The poor f After returning to the UK and trying his hand at a few smaller Poyet-style schemes, dude, he already got away with it. Give up, man, come on. Uh, he eventually settled down in Venezuela, where he was welcomed back as a war hero and lived out his final days as a respected member of the community on a generous military pension. Oh no. He was buried with full military honors. I. I <laughs> f what a dickhead. It's a bit of a shame that nobody thought to put their gravestone in Poyais. Yeah, that's where it would belong. Nowhere. Michael de Guzman. There's nothing like a good old sniff of gold to get stock prices surging. In 1993, the Canadian penny stock mining company Briex snapped up a nice little spot of land at the head of the Busang River in Indonesia. At first, the world didn't really take much notice, and shares in the company went for a literal few cents on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. But then rumors started flying that Briex had struck gold, and that's when traders and investors suddenly started getting twitchy noses. I guess that this is the modern day equivalent of the good old fashioned gold rushes when thousands of miners would be gripped by gold fever and flock to the promised lands with their spades to dig their own slice of the fortune. These days, you can usually get a slice of the action without ever leaving the comfort of your own swivel chair. The project manager of the new site was Filipino mining prospector Michael de Guzman, who in 1994 produced samples from the site which contained crushed gold. 
I'm getting the feeling he faked this. Isn't there a movie, uh, a Michael McConaughey movie uh, around this where they like fake the gold in the thing and then they sell the mine to someone or something? It suddenly became clear that Briex might just have purchased one of the largest gold deposits ever have been discovered, uh, or as the Lehman Brothers were to phrase it when they were making strong recommendation to invest, the gold discovery of the century. I like how it's like, okay, so the guy who owns the company tests it and says like, yeah, there's gold there. I swear, like, I know the words due diligence because it's something that investors do before investing, you know? Like Lehman Brothers, although they're no longer in business. <laughs> Over the next few years, Michael de Guzman was able to produce thousands more samples containing enough gold for the company to conclude that there could be as much as 13 million pounds of gold just waiting to be dug up there in them hills. Naturally, the stock market responded with just a bit of fizzy excitement, with Briex share prices rising from a few cents to 286 Canadian dollars. Penny stock mining company suddenly found itself with a market capitalization of six billion dollars. So they went from barely anything Thing to like billions. Although apparently they did produce thousands more, thousands more samples. But I'm beginning to think this is actually what this Michael McConaughey movie was based on, because I'm pretty sure this is exactly what they did. Hold on. Yes, the movie is based on this story. Or, you know, uh, creative license and all that shit, of course. Loosely based on. At this point, the president of Indonesia began to sit up and take notice too. He wasn't entirely happy that a relatively small Canadian company looked set to make a fortune from digging up his country's gold from right under his nose, and argued that Briex was far too small a firm to oversee this rich find alone. What the f Then don't sell it to them. You can't just be like, well, yeah, we sold you this land. It turns out there's loads of gold in there, so we want our share. You f***ing sold it! Indonesia? You don't get a slice now? A deal was eventually thrashed out in which Briex would be allowed to continue digging, but only in partnership with Indonesia and a more established mining company. That's f***ed up. Can you imagine if this was your mining company and it actually was loads of gold in there? You'd be like, oh great. So now uh, we, took, we took all the risk and now we get f***ed. Good news and bad news. I'm pretty sure it's just a scam. Uh, there was just the small matter of a new independent survey to be carried out to verify the existence of gold and everything would be good to go. So this company rose to a market cap of $6 billion. And now <laughs> we are talking about an independent survey. Really, guys? And it was around this time that the wheels came off the whole operation because it turns out there was no gold in them hills. During Michael de Guzman's original sampling test, he had actually shaved a bit of gold from his own wedding ring to ensure the samples would impress potential investors. Of course, thousands of other samples would be taken over the next few years, and Michael's wedding ring wasn't that big. But he got around this problem by using around $61,000 worth of locally sourced crushed gold to salt the samples and give them the impression Briex was sitting on a gold mine. I bet as soon as this guy's like having to give away chunks to the Indonesian government and some random American mining company that's bigger than him, he's like, glad I f***ed it up, really. But there remains a whiff of mystery as to who might have been pulling all the strings here and what exactly happened to Michael de Guzman. Let's not forget that Michael was only a project manager. He was? Oh, I... <laughs> I read these aloud and I guess I don't pay attention. The founder and CEO of Briex, David Walsh, continually denied any knowledge of what was going on and died while in custody, even though he was on suicide watch and there were two cameras that were just saying, no, I'm just kidding. He died of an aneurysm in 1998 in the Bahamas, just three weeks after Mascar's gunman had broken into his home and threatened to kill him if they didn't get their money back. A few weeks before the scandal broke, Michael de Guzman was already dead. It's convenient timing. Uh, he had reportedly committed suicide by jumping out of a helicopter that was flying over Indonesia? Well, I guess it's one way to go, but it also sounds like a pretty good way to kill someone. Yeah, yeah, we were in the helicopter and he jumped out. Yeah, jumped. Oh, wait, the both guys died. Oh, that is, yeah, oh dear. Although a body was found days later in the jungle, the legs and arms and other fairly important bits were missing, and it could only be identified by molars and a thumbprint. Just what? one to his body. People came and chopped up his body and then just left it there? <laughs> but was it really the body of Michael de Guzman? It looks like people made quite an effort to make it not look like his body. One journalist claims that a body had gone missing from the local morgue and just hours before the helicopter took to the skies, and there have also been various alleged sightings of Michael in Canada over the years, though he remains officially dead. It could be the case that Michael de Guzman's follow-up scam was a little more successful than his first. Yeah, this is massively, like, it's like, so we set up a big scam, we get a market capitalization of six billion, and then we just disappear. Fake death? Pretty good. He's probably hanging out in the Bahamas. Don't sue me. Although you won't sue me, because if you sue me, then people will know you're still alive, and yeah, yeah, whatever. Victor Lustig, 
Uh, this is also some guy we've covered on Biographics. Don't skip ahead, you're gonna get my little take on it and Danny's. Scrap metal dealers probably have good days and bad days, but the French businessman André Poisson must have thought he was having a particularly good day back in 1925 when he was presented with the opportunity to buy the Eiffel Tower for scrap. The tower had fallen into disrepair by the 1920s and was becoming increasingly expensive for the French government to maintain. Along with several other scrap metal dealers, André Poisson was invited to a top secret meeting at a luxury hotel to speak with a government official called Victor Lustig, who broke the confidential news that the Eiffel Tower was to be sold to the highest bidder and invited the guests to make their pitch for the global icon of France. First thing there, I don't know if they're like regular government bureaucrat who's dealing with scrap metal dealers hosts the meetings at luxury hotels. I'd be like, it's a bit suspicious. Bad news for André Poisson was that he had some serious competition. But the good news was that the government official appeared to be completely bent. During a later private meeting between the pair, Victor Lastig whispered in André's ear that he might be happy to take a large bribe to ensure that André ended up with a winning bid. Tempting. It's believed that André Poisson handed up to as much as $200,000 to Victor, a very dodgy token of goodwill. Sadly for André Poisson, it turns out Victor Lustig wasn't actually a government official at all, and certainly wasn't in a position to sell one of the most recognizable buildings in the world for a nice bit of scrap metal. André was left fuming as Victor fled to Austria with the money to avoid any potential repercussions. And this is what makes a good scam. Because clearly, he's done something illegal. Like, he was trying to bribe a public official. So what's he going to do? Go to the police and it's like, yeah, this guy cons me. Uh, so what happened, sir? Well, he said he was from the government. So I gave him $200,000. Oh. Oh, oh, shit. <laughs> but yeah, there weren't any repercussions. Andre Poisson never approached the police, as this would have been admitting that he'd tried to bribe the government's official. Danny and I are on the same page. Also... I made a biographics about this guy, so I kind of know what's up. So Victor Lustig was free to return to Paris and pull exactly the same trick again. Yes, he became the man who sold the Eiffel Tower twice. His third attempt to sell the, he's really pushing it, to sell the Eiffel Tower didn't work out quite so well as the police were on his trail by this time, so Victor fled to the United States, where he continued to pull off all, cr all manner of crazy scams and con tricks. He sold currency duplicating machines which promised to make the buyers rich beyond their wildest dreams but actually contained a few genuine notes hidden inside to disguise the fact that they didn't work so you could call them fake, fake money machines. Um, this is actually a really interesting one that we do touch on in the biographics video so check that out. I'll link to it below. Did my mic come off when I did that? No, we're okay. Uh, at one point he even managed to con Al Capone out of $5,000 which makes you wonder if Victor Lustig was actually just a complete loony with some sort of very complicated death wish that never really quite panned out for him. There's loads of people you can con. <laughs> Why con Al Capone? That seems like really dangerous. The strong arm of the law did eventually catch up to Victor Lustig in 1935 when he was arrested for counterfeiting and eventually sentenced to 20 years in Alcatraz where he died of pneumonia in 1947. Yeah, like Alcatraz sounds like a pretty bad... Is it true that in Alcatraz was like the only prison they had hot showers because it discouraged the prisoners from like trying to swim to shore because it was really cold and the hot showers made them comfortable and warm? That's probably not true. That's probably just an urban legend, right? His death certificate described him as an apprentice salesman, which does have a certain ring of truth to it, even if it doesn't tell the whole story. They put your job on your death certificate? <laughs> Simon Whistler, YouTuber. People are going to be very confused by that in a hundred years. Rudy Carnayawan. Collectors can sometimes seem like an odd bunch of people. And I suppose I can count myself among that odd number as I've built up a pretty big collection of books over the years. I don't think I collect anything. I collect YouTube channels. <laughs> I like to convince myself that it's not just about the collecting. These books can actually be read and enjoyed over and over again. The fact that they happen to form a collection on the bookshelves is just a side effect of being a happy bookworm. Fascinating. <laughs> This doesn't really explain why half the books on my shelves remain unread, though, or why I buy fancy editions of books when I've gotten uh, when I've got four other editions that I haven't also read. But I'm sure there are weirder things to collect than books. Take wine collectors, for example. Why exactly are they pissing about? Well, with wine, I mean, at least you get to enjoy it. Although I suppose if you're collecting it. Do you ever drink it? For starters, vintage wine is a bloody expensive thing to collect. But also, you're not even likely to drink or even open a bottle of vintage wine you've just splashed out hundreds of thousands of dollars on. So you're essentially just collecting liquid in glass bottles. And you've never, and if you'd never opened those bottles, how would you ever know if the stuff inside was genuine anyway? You could have just paid $250,000, that's absurd, for a bottle of something that's going for $7 down at the supermarket with an offer to buy two and get one free. Wine collecting seems like a hobby just ripe for exploitation. And this is where Rudy Kurniawan comes in. Born in Indonesia, 
Is this the second time we're mentioning Indonesia today? A land of con men. Sorry, Indonesia, please don't sue me. I'm sure like 80% of your population are not con, con men. Born in Indonesia, Rudy arrived in the United States in the late 1990s, although he was later denied a visa, so he just decided to stay anyway as an illegal alien, okay? His family already had a bit of form on the fraud scene. Two of his uncles managed to swindle $800 million for an Indonesian bank, and not a cent has been ever recovered. That's gotta be one of the biggest cons ever. His family already had a bit of form. Holy shit. Like that's, I mean, not Bernie Madoff level, but pretty big. But Rudy had managed to build up a little bit of celebrity status in Los Angeles as a wine connoisseur with a particular preference of Burgundy. He began hosting major wine tasting sessions with other collectors and splashed out so much money on the expensive brand produced by Domaine de la Romanie Conti. It's not, <laughs> I'm not fancy enough to know how to pronounce that. Uh, he was given the nickname Dr. Conti. At one point, he was rumored to be spending over a million dollars a month on high-end Burgundy, although it's still a mystery as to where exactly he was getting most of his money from. Maybe his uncles shoved a few dollars inside his birthday cards every year. By the mid-noughties, Rudy, Rudy, whatever his name is, had earned a reputation as one of the world's biggest wine collectors, boasting arguably the greatest wine seller on earth. So his wine auctions attracted a lot of interest at the time. Uh, in fact, when he auctioned off an enormous batch from his collection at Akamura and Condit in 2006, it sold for $24.7 million. Oh my God. Smashing the world record for a wine auction. The previous record was only 10 million. I bet they were screw screwtops. <laughs> However, Considering the topic of this video, I'm sure it won't come as a major surprise to discover that Rudy had actually spent years raking in millions of dollars from fake wines. Rudy was operating a complete counterfeiting workshop in which cheap wines were poured into expensive vintage bottles to add several healthy zeros to their value. What's more surprising is that he may have got away with the scam for far longer and duped many more collectors out of their millions if he hadn't made two crucial mistakes. The first mistake was selling a small batch of expensive wines to billionaire businessmen and 1992 America couple winner Bill Cock. Probably because he's a billionaire. He's like, yeah, let's crack open that $250,000 bottle of wine. And you taste it and it's like a Merlot. For some reason, Bill smelled something fishy and it wasn't expensive burgundy. I strongly suspect like, um, that unlike the majority of wine collectors, Bill actually bothered to uncork the bottle and serve the wine to his guests. He's a billionaire. He can just go buy more. It'd be pretty cool, right? <laughs> like, just cracking a quarter million bottle of wine like it's nothing. He probably put it on his black card. We did a video about exclusive credit cards. I'll link to it below. But that dinner party may have turned a bit flat when the guests realized they were tasting cheap supermarket stuff. The second mistake was far more careless. Rudy produced and auctioned a batch of fake, fake print vintage wines of Clos and Denise, which, lay, which the labels claimed were produced by the company Domain Poisson during the years 1945 and 1971. This sparked the interest of the head of Domain Poisson, mainly because his company didn't start producing that range of wine until 1982. That's just lazy research. Just go online and find it out. Not hard. Billionaire Bill Koch hired a private investigator to look into Rudy's dodgy wine cellar while the FBI conducted their own investigations following growing suspicions from the wine collection community. It's believed that Bill Cock actually had more resources than the FBI at his disposal. Is that true? I mean, he is mad rich. And ultimately uncovered more evidence uh, of the counterfeiting operation, although he was happy to settle with Rudy out of court for $3 million. However, in 2013, Rudy became the first man in history to be found guilty of wine fraud and was sentenced to 10 years in prison in Texas, after which he will be deported to Indonesia. That's pretty shitty. So, so this guy managed to start this whole legitimate business, even though he was an illegal immigrant, and he was selling like $24 million of wine to Bill Koch, and they were like, uh, <laughs> having no ID. <laughs> like, what? Meanwhile, it's believed that as many as 10,000 bottles of Dr. Conti's counterfeit wine may still be lurking in wine cellars of collectors who haven't got a clue that they're fakes. It serves them right for indulging in such a silly hobby. This has been Business Blaze. This was a long one, and you guys probably didn't notice it, but in this video there was a cut where I went fully to the dentist for an hour and came back. The magic of television! Thank you everybody for watching. If you watch to the end, you're an absolute legend because, you know, smash that dislike button. It doesn't really matter. All that matters is you watch these videos to the end, and for that, you guys are heroes. Here's something for you. Bada boom boom! Write the goddamn script, Daddy!